Hello, my name is Tom Roberts, and I would like to welcome you to the presentation for the Plumbing Code of Australia in 2019. This presentation will provide an overview of the changes to volume three of the NCC in 2019. A recording of the seminar will be available on the ABCB website. Likewise, there will also be a copy of the Building Code of Australia and uh, Standards Australia's presentation as well. In fact, all our seminars are available on the ABCB website since 2016. So if you or colleagues have missed a presentation, feel free to uh, review it there. This seminar will probably cover uh, changes to the Plumbing Code of Australia, or PCA, which I'll run through first. There's an overview for the changes to reference documents applicable to plumbing. I'll provide you a bit of information on the Watermark Certification Scheme, and I'll let you know about some areas that the ABCB will be working on for the next three years in anticipation for NCC 2022. So firstly and most importantly, you need to know is the adoption date for 2019, the transition and the transition period applicable to the PCA. 2019 NCC becomes the current code on the 1st of May this year, so 2019. Every state or territory has different legislation covering the PCA, so if you're not sure which edition applies for a specific project, make sure you contact your relevant state or territory plumbing authority. So the adoption of the 2018 edition of Australian New Zealand Standard 4020 for the testing of products in contact of drinking water uh, has been provided for a uh, transition period for 2019. So this transition period allows for the test, test reports to be based on the 2005 edition of 4020 to continue to be accepted until the 1st of May 2024. However, test reports prepared after the reference date of NCC 2019 so the 1st of May 2019, must be based on the 2018 edition of Australian Standard. So the Watermark Administration will also be releasing a notice of direction to provide additional information on this transition. One of the uh, major projects that ABCB is working on is readability. The NCC is a complex document full of long sentences that can be hard to understand, so we've rewritten it, made it, it simpler, language as possible. Volume 3, the Plumbing Code of Australia, has been the first to be written under this project, and we're also adjusting the structure to make it easier to understand. As part of making the PCA more readable, we've used exemption and limitation boxes. These, use, these are used to separate the content out of smaller parts and make it easier to understand. You'll also notice a new numbering system for the first subclause there is a number rather than a letter. Volume 3 has been rewritten using this numbering system, and we're also working on having volumes 1 and 2 uh, also replicate this numbering system. This will produce a consistent structure across all volumes of the NCC. So, in summary, all the technical content will stay the same, but the structures and the content will be more readable and easy to use. So moving on to the changes to the plumbing code. So we'll start with section A, the governing requirements. So it was found that in fact there was three different volumes of the code and three different structures, which was making it very difficult for practitioners to use different volumes of the code. So here's the first step towards a common structure, which is found in 2019. On the left, you'll see section A of the PCA for 2016 and for NCC 2019 and that all three volumes will now share a common section A. Section A contains information about how to use the NCC, what a performance solution is, what uh, building classifications are, and all the governing requirements as we could now call them. So the governing requirements of the NCC provide the rules and instructions for using and complying with the NCC. And as I said, all three volumes now contain a consistent structure and also consistent schedules. So the first schedule to contain, uh, contains the appendices of each state and territory for that volume. Abbreviations and symbols are already appendices at the back of each volume and has been combined to create a common schedule. There's also definitions and a list of reference documents contained for all three volumes of the NCC. Schedule 5, 6 and 7 have also been included to be consistent across all three volumes, however, primarily relate to building. 
Here's an example of a uh, new Schedule 3 which contains NCC defined terms. Uh, it's now at the back of each volume and you can see all definitions from all volumes. As you can see on the slide, some definitions may be familiar with and re relate to plumbing terms and others you might not be as familiar with because they relate to the uh, defined terms of the BCA. So in the following section we'll cover the main changes to section B, water services. Firstly, we'll start on uh, part B2, heated water services. Firstly, performance requirement BP 2.5, Legionella control. This performance requirement states that heated water must be stored and delivered under conditions which avoid the likelihood of bacteria growth. One of the ways compliance can be uh, verified is through the use of verification method BV 2.2, heated water storage temperature. This method verifies the growth of Legionella is avoided in a heated water system when, all, when the water heater is designed to, as such that the water will be subject to temperature dependent minimum exposure periods. For example, BV 2.2 shows that a, minimum, that a temperature of 70 degrees or greater is a minimum exposure period for one second and at 66 degrees, two minutes and at 60 degrees, 32 minutes. So they're the, the, the time frames required to avoid the likelihood of Legionella bacteria growth. It's important to remember that this verification method is used only when undertaking a performance solution and is only one of the w methods to actually verify uh, compliance with this performance requirement. So there's also new deemed to satisfy provisions. So BP 2.5, maximum delivery temperature. So this uh, deemed to satisfy a requirement may look familiar to some. So this provision applies to only new heated water installations for the purpose of uh, personal hygiene and states that the delivery temperature of a heated water at the outlet of each sanitary fixture must not be more than 45 degrees Celsius in any aged care building, health care building, early childhood centre, primary or secondary school or a designated accessible facility. And of course, not more than 50 degrees Celsius in any, all other cases. The next addition to part B2 is part B26, temperature control devices. So also for new heated water installations only, these provisions outline acceptable temperature control devices for each outlet temperature limitation. So this is linked to the previous clause which outlined delivery temperatures, which was previously discussed and requires the delivery of not more than 45 degrees Celsius at the outlet. So the provision states that water temperature at the outlet in these situations must be controlled by either a thermostatic mixing valve or a thermostatically controlled tap. The next addition to part B2 is B2.6, temperature control devices. Also for new heated water installations only, these provisions outline acceptable temperature control devices for each temperature limitation. Linked to the previous clause which outlines the delivery temperatures, these provisions uh, describe the temperature control devices which are acceptable means to deliver those temperatures. These provisions state that, in, that the water temperature at the outlet in these situations must be controlled by a thermostatic mixing valve or a thermostatically controlled tap for those temperatures limited to 45 degrees Celsius. Similarly, B2 0.62 applies to B2.51B, which requires the delivery of not more than 50 degrees Celsius at the outlet. This provision states that the water temperature at the outlet must be controlled by either a thermostatic mixing valve, a thermostatically controlled tap, a tempering valve, or a temperature limited water heater. As new technologies are introduced to the marketplace, there may be additional means for delivering um, temp water temperatures that meet the performance requirements in B2.2. These performance requirements relate to the delivery of temp water from fixtures and appliances at a temperature which is unlikely to scold. Although new product types are not listed in this clause, a performance solution may be utilised to allow them to be installed. So to, for more information on how to develop a performance solution, visit the ABCB website. General deemed to satisfy requirement B2.9 references ASNZS 3500 part 4 for the installation of heated water services. In association with this provision, a new note has been included. 
This note states there is no deemed to satisfy provisions for warm water systems. This is being included in PCA 2019 to ensure that practitioners are aware that a performance solution must always be undertaken when installing or designing a warm water system and that there is no deemed to satisfy solution available. The next part of B is part B4, firefighting water services. So changes this part were primarily a result of a proposal for change submitted to the ABCB. The amendments apply to part B 4.2, which provides general deemed to satisfy provisions for firefighting water services. The main amendment to this part is the reference to two new FPAA technical specifications for firefighting water, uh, sprinkler systems, which can be used instead of a system that is fully complies with AS2118. Our new technical specifications are FPAA101H and FPAA101D. For those who may not be familiar with FPAA, FPAA stands for Fire Protection Association of Australia. They're the peak, national peak body for fire safety and provide information, services, education to the fire protection industry and the community. It is also important to remember that the firefighting water services for class two to nine buildings must, own, must comply with part E1 of the NCC in volume one. So these new technical specifications, Technical specification FPAA101H is for automatic fire sprinkler design and installation for hydrant water supply. This technical specification specifies the minimum requirements for the components, design, installation, commissioning of a combined fire hydrant and fire sprinkler system for buildings which have a rise in stories of four or more and are less than 25 metres in effective height and contain class two and class three parts. This system is referred to commonly as the FPAA101H system. Technical specification 101D, automatic fire sprinkler system design and installation for drinking water supply. So this technical specification specifies the minimum requirements of components, design, installation, commissioning of a fire sprinkler system for a building which has a rise in story of four or more as uh, less than 25 metres in effective height, contains class two and three parts. And this system is supplied from the building's drinking water supply system and is commonly referred to the FPAA101D sprinkler system. So FPAA are undertaking a national awareness seminar series, which will be uh, providing uh, information to practitioners looking to use these systems. And we'll also be providing uh, ongoing training to designers and installers wishing to use them. So keep an eye out for any related information on this. So one of the major amendments to the water services section is the inclusion of new part by, uh, B5 cross connection control. This part sets out cross connection hazards and the corresponding hazard ratings and has been included as one of the recommendations of the backflow prevention research report. The report was an outcome of one of the ABCB's plumbing code development research projects. And like other, many other parts of the PCA, it starts with a performance requirement. So BP 5.1, uh, contamination control, states that a water service must be designed, constructed and installed to avoid contamination to the water service type it applies to. So the performance requirements is used where a performance solution has been undertaken. However, where a deemed to satisfy solution has been used, this perf performance requirement is complied with by, um, by using the deemed to satisfy solution. So B5.2 for, is for cross connection control. So subclause one states that a hazard exists wherever it is possible for contaminants to enter the drinking water service or supply by a potential cross connection. Subclause two states that each hazard must be assigned to an, indiv an individual hazard rating or zone hazard rating and be isolated from the drinking water service by an appropriate backflow prevention device. Subclause um, sub 3 states that where a site is served by a network utility operator's drinking water supply, an appropriate containment protection must be selected and installed. So a network utility operator is defined by the NCC. So for this application, it means a person who undertakes the pipe distribution of drinking water or a non-drinking water supply. 
The network utility operator is a water authority which is licensed to supply water and may be a licensed utility, local government or a council. But B5.3, the cross-connection control of non-drinking water services. This provision states that a hazard exists wherever it is possible for water or contaminants to enter the non-drinking water supply or service via any potential cross-connection between itself and other separate non-drinking water service on the same site. A separate non-drinking water service means one that is, draws water from a different source. For example, a site connected to both recycled water and rainwater. Both are non-drinking water services, but are drawn from separate sources. Therefore, each would require a separate non-drinking water service. Each hazard must be assigned a contaminant hazard rating, a contaminant hazard rating in accordance with specification B5.1 and be isolated from the non-drinking water service by appropriate means of protection, which is selected and installed in accordance with ASNZS 3500 Part 1. B5.4 is for cross-connection control for firefighting water services. It states that each firefighting water service must be assigned a hazard rating and be isolated from the drinking water service by an appropriate backflow prevention device. A number of new deemed to satisfy provisions reference specification B5.1 cross-connection hazards. This specification outlines the protection types and hazard ratings used for individual protection at the point of each individual hazard, zone protection at the point where a group of hazards can be isolated, hazards opposed, posed by the site to the network utility operators drinking water supply, and for firefighting water services. The hazard ratings prescribed in this specification must be used for selecting the required backflow prevention device for the purposes of compliance with the deemed to satisfy provisions. So this specification only prescribes hazard ratings for a limited list of known hazards. It does not cover every potential cross-connection that may arise from time to time. Where a situation arises that is not listed, in this specification, an appropriate hazard rating may be determined through a performance solution. In some jurisdictions, regulations under water supply legislation and or the rules set out by the network utility operator may prescribe containment protection, which may differ from this specification. So if this occurs, then those regulations and or rules should then be followed in place of this specification. The specification only applies to the purposes of compliance of NCC Volume 3 and is not intended to limit or extend uh, the application of any other regulations. And the last part of Section B is Part B6 for rainwater harvesting and use. The rainwater harvesting system is defined within the NCC as a plumbing installation that comprises of any plumbing that connects to a rainwater tank and to any drinking water or non-drinking water outlets and any top-up line that conveys drinking water from the network utility operator's water supply to a rainwater tank. So this part has been included as an outcome of the Rainwater Harvesting and Use Research Report, which provided recommendations on a national approach for rainwater harvesting. The report is an outcome of the ABCB's Plumbing Code Development Research Project. In this part, there are four performance requirements which cover stored rainwater, rainwater harvesting system installations, rainwater services, and identification. So performance requirement BP 6.1 to BP 6.4 are satisfied by complying with DTS provisions from B 6.2 to B 6.5. While B 6.1 outlines the application of the DTS provisions, 6.2 covers the collection of rainwater, 6.3, primarily references B1 for cold water services for the installation of the top-up lines. B6.4 outlines the requirements for buried and partially buried rainwater tanks. And B6.5 is for rainwater pipe work and outlets and covers the installation and identification of rainwater pipe work and outlets. Section D is for excessive noise. This is a new section within the Plumbing Code of Australia and however, the provisions may look familiar to some users of the PCA. This section has been created as uh, a result of harmonisation work between both 
the Building Code of Australia and the Plumbing Code of Australia. And it has also consolidated a number of requirements which were often repeated throughout numerous sections of the Plumbing Code. Section D sets out the requirements to prevent excessive noise being generated from a plumbing or drainage system that could cause illness, loss of amenity to occupants in the building. So in this part, there are two performance requirements which cover undue and excessive noise. So these performance requirements state that a plumbing or drainage system must be designed, constructed and installed in a manner that does not create undue noise. They also state that a plumbing or drainage system must be designed to reduce the transmission of airborne or impact generated sound, which may cause illness or loss of amenity to the occupants. So the performance requirement only applies to a plumbing or drainage system that is located in a separating wall for a class one building or a class two, three or nine C building that is required to be sound rated. Remember that the building classifications are outlined in the NCC. Performance requirement BP 1.2 subclause 2 states that the required sound insulation of a floor or wall must not be compromised by the incorporation or penetration of a plumbing or drainage system. It is also important to note that part F5 in volume 1 of the NCC contains performance requirements which cover sound transmission and insulation in walls and floors of class 2, 3 and 9C buildings. Similarly, Volume 2 of the NCC contains performance requirements which cover the sound insulation of walls in Class 1 buildings. So the deemed to satisfy provisions for this section are quite simple. In order to prevent undue noise, D1.2 provides provisions requiring plumbing or drainage systems to comply with the relevant part of the PCA. For example, B1.4 for cold water systems and C2.4 for sanitary drainage systems. It also is required to insulate occupants from sound created from plumbing and drainage systems in certain classes of buildings. B1.3 requires appropriate sound insulation between sole occupancy units, flexible couplings for connections to pumps, and requirements around systems which pass through or is located in separating walls. So this slide shows a number of these provisions as are examples from extracts from the code. Next, we'll move on to new section E for facilities. Again, first we'll look at the performance requirements of section E. And for this one, there's only one performance requirement. This performance requirement states that while plumbing and drainage system is provided, supply taps or other operational controls must be accessible and suitable for use. The performance requirements may look familiar to some users of the PCA, and that is because it is simply being relocated into one standalone section of the code and reduces the duplication throughout numerous sections of the PCA. So the deemed to satisfy provisions which can be used to satisfy performance requirements EP 1.1 are outlined in E 1.2. E 1.2 states that where a supply tap or in other operational controls are provided in sanitary facilities for people with a disability, they must be in accordance with AS 1428 parts one and two. As you can see on the slide, there are two different editions of 1428 part one. The 2001 edition must be used for passenger use areas of class nine B and class 10 public, tra public transport buildings. And the 2009 edition can be used for all other buildings. It's important to note that volume one of the NCC sets out the requirements for, these, for the design and construction of san sanitary facilities in class 1B, 1A, 2 and 9 buildings. A number of sections have been removed from the PCA in 2019. These include stormwater drainage systems, heating, ventilation and air conditioning, and on-site wastewater systems. They've been removed because the majority of the states and territories around Australia did not adopt these sections. And for the jurisdictions that did, they've simply been relocated to the state and territory appendix which is now contained in Schedule 1, the State and Territory Variations and Additions. There's also been a substantial amount of change to the documents referenced in the PCA, including the 2018 editions of the ASNZS 3500 series. So this table provides an overview of the amount of change to reference documents in 2019. There are two new reference documents 
which are the FPAA technical specifications, which I mentioned before. There have been four documents which have been modified. These include the 40, ASNZS 4020, testing of products in contact with drinking water, and ASNZS 3500 parts one, two, and four. There have been 31 deleted references from the NCC uh, volume three. So this has probably been the result of those removed sections from the PCA. It includes documents such as ASNZS 1546, on-site wastewater treatment units, and AS 1668, the use of mechanical ventilation and air conditioning in buildings. So the reference to ASNZS 3500 part five has also been removed. This means that the standard can no longer be used and that ASNZS 3500 parts one, two, and four must now be used for all classes of buildings. So it's important to note that this list does not include documents referenced within the NCC schedules, such as schedule fee defined terms, and an extensive list of NCC reference documents and their editions can be found in schedule four of the NCC. So as, as mentioned, there's been a number of modified reference documents and one of those major revisions was to 3500 part one, 2018. So 3500 part one covers water services and the changes to this standard cover backflow prevention and fire services, requirements for the protection of plastic pipes and fittings in contact with direct, uh, installed in direct sunlight, changes to non-drinking water services section of the standard and some minor changes as a result of the inclusion of circuitry heated water systems, which has been made to 3500 part four. There's also been a clarification on jointing methods and some minor technical changes to address some previous concerns uh, relating to other projects. For ASNZS 3500 part two, sanitary plumbing and drainage, the revision covered a range of sanitary drainage topics, but the major projects related to the inclusion of structural plastic uh, relining of drains and the protection of plastic pipes and fittings installed in direct sunlight. The revision of 3500 part three, 2018, stormwater drainage was undertaken to respond to changes in practice and technology. So some of those changes include uh, the inclusion of siphonic drainage, rainwater tanks, biofiltration, updates to formulas and rainfall maps and addresses new stormwater drainage technology. It should be noted that for ASNZS 3500 part three is now only referenced by volume one and two of the NCC and not by the Plumbing Code of Australia. The revision to ASNZS 3500 part four, heated water, incorporates changes to the provisions for heated water circulatory systems, protection of plastic pipes and fittings installed in direct sunlight again, a clarification on jointing methods, and the inclusion to the reference to thermostatically controlled taps, allowing their use as a temperature control device. So there's also an amendment made to this standard with changes to clause 6521 to provide additional option for the orientation of solar water heaters. So that concludes the changes to the PCA in 2019, but I'd also like to highlight a few key points regarding the watermark certification scheme, which are important to users of the PCA. So firstly, it's important to note that all, not all products require watermark certification. However, all plumbing products and materials in, used in a plumbing and drainage installation require a risk assessment. So this risk assessment will determine whether or not watermark certification is necessary. So this document, the watermark schedule of products, lists products which have been predetermined to require watermark certification. This document, the watermark schedule of excluded products list products that have been predetermined to be excluded from the watermark certification scheme. To ensure the uh, materials and products are still fit for purpose, those listed on the watermark schedule of excluded products must be supported by evidence of suitability. This is in accordance with A2.2 of the Plumbing Code of Australia, whereas it's being used in a plumbing or drainage installation. So one option to demonstrate that the product is suitable is compliance with one of the specifications listed. Where the product is excluded from requiring certification and includes integral components that are listed on the watermark schedule of products, each of those components must be individually certified. And lastly, the watermark database. So the watermark product database lists products that have been certified and marked in accordance with the requirements of the watermark certification scheme. 
These products are recognised by plumbing regulators as being authorised for use in a plumbing or drainage installation. And you can search by either watermark licence number, licensee names, product specifications, the product type, the brand name, the model name, or even the model identification. So filters enable refined searches for the product. And from the search results, you can select a specific category, certificate, product, and view the detailed information. To, supply the use, to support the use of the database, a YouTube clip using the product database has been developed. The clip provides an overview of, the search, of how to search for certificates and products, key, download key information, and, if you, and how, what you do if you can't find a plumbing material or product on the database. And lastly, in this section of the presentation, I'd like to give an overview of what the ABCB will be working towards in 2022. So some of the major projects the ABCB will be working on over the next few years in preparation for NCC 2022 include digitisation, education materials, plumbing code development research and quantification, the potential for a gas fitting code of Australia, and an analysis on the costs and benefits of moving to reduce or eliminate lead in plumbing products. So firstly, we'll go on to digitisation. So digitisation improvements are being made to enhance access and understanding of the NCC for a range of new technologies. The initiative will focus on major improvements to the NCC online, but work has been undertaken to ensure that a digital NCC is able to be integrated with other systems. But what does that all mean? So what if an NCC could integrate with other online systems? So the ABCB is involved with a number of projects with uh, Standards Australia Incubator Program, and that is to explore other areas where innovation is possible. So one example of this investigation is a digital glossary of construction terms, which combines all the definitions from the NCC, referenced Australian standards, and handbooks. So what if, similar to the NCC, you could stream an Australian standard directly onto your phone? So again, Standards Australia has been working towards uh, exploring this question and how are piloting and are now piloting a digital version of ASNZS 3500 Part 2, 2018. Now, what if all these documents could interact with each other? For example, NCC reference documents such as Australian Standards and the reference to that document is a link, which takes you directly to the, stand the section of the standard that it's being referenced. Additional benefits over the traditional PDF versions include enhanced searches, hyperlinks to other documents, dynamic table of contents, responsible, responsive tables and figures, and links to other resources, which is an important part of providing additional guidance on the requirements of the code. So all this work is in its very early stages, and a number of the Standards Australia projects are only proofs of concept at this time. But is as you can see on the slides, is um, this investigation into what what is possible in a digital world is going to be of benefit, great benefit to the users of the PCA. So the resource library on the ABCB website contains all ABCB resources, including consultation documents, non-mandatory handbooks, ABCB standards, tools, uh, calculators, videos, awareness resource kits, and other publications. So keep an eye out for free new handbooks which are in development. These handbooks will cover topics such as cross-connection control, warm water systems, and rainwater harvesting and use. So the ABCB is always upgrading existing materials to ensure that they're up to date as well as developing new and other types of education material. You may also see ABCB staff supporting a number of plumbing events around the country in the future. So the ABCB has an ongoing project to conduct research contribute to the future development of the Plumbing Code of Australia. So this includes continuing investigations into new and innovative methods of sanitary plumbing and drainage pipe sizing, as well as the development of a verification method and calculators for areas such as water service pipe sizes. So to address the COAG, or Council of Australian Government's decision to establish an NCC, dealing with all on-site construction, 
Davis AB will be working on the feasibility of the development of a gas feeding component of the NCC, which can be considered for NCC in 2022. So this work is obviously subject to the ABCB board approvals and the building minister's forum agreement. But it's something that it would be of interest to plumbers who undertake gas fitting work. Also, in 2018, the ABCB commissioned the Macquarie University to conduct a literature review to determine what, to what extent plumbing products and materials may contribute to lead levels in excess of those permitted by the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines. So this report is currently available on the ABCB website and the ABCB will be continuing to look into this area. So we'll be undertaking a regulatory impact statement on moving to a low lead or lead free plumbing products. And this will include investigation of the appropriate mechanisms, options for stringency, and the need for transitional provisions to enable industry adjustment in consultation with the key stakeholders. This could be such as Standards Australia and health and industry. And that's a snapshot of, being, of the work being conducted by the ABC in, 2020, in preparation for NCC 2022. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you for watching.